suppose we have to go to the ends of the solar system. So this is a plot of the long period comets. And we'll take a look at the scales down here. Again, this is Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune's orbits. All right, the scale here is 50 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the distance between Earth and the Sun. Neptune for scale is 30 astronomical units. It's roughly a perfect circle, about 30 astronomical units in radius. So where do these things end? Not a single one of these things ends inside this box. You actually have up to a box out to 10,000 astronomical units to find the orbits of the long period comets. So they've got some really, really, really long orbits. Now this is just one, one, one uh, visual. Let me show you some evidence for, what we're, what, for, for the cloud of comets that we, we suspect exist. So here we have the comet number of comets, and up here is their orbital period. And the dividing line is set at 200 years. That's sort of arbitrary. But you'll notice there is a peak of comets down here around seven years. These are the short period comets. And those are the ones that are in the main belt of comets. But we also have a peak up here, a much, much, much larger peak um, with the orbital periods uh, stretching towards infinity, which means there are thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years for their orbital period. So most of the comets we have ever seen are long period comets. All right? And the eccentricity, the shape of their orbits, is really, really long. All right? Zero on this on this plot would be a perfect circle. One on this plot would be a straight line. Where do we find most of the orbits? Even amongst the short period comets, most of them are highly elliptical, highly eccentric, really elongated orbits amongst these comets, which you might expect from something that has been tidally perturbed. Um, gravity has moved their orbits around. If we take the orbital inclination, now this is the, the, the tilt of the orbit. So the orbit flat would be zero uh, in the plane, and then tilt it up to 90, and then all the way around to 180. Okay, so we've got the orbital tilt. So we have a peak down here at low inclinations, which is the short period comets that are in that main belt. Then we have a roughly smooth distribution, a flat distribution. So the long period comets are all at relatively even eccentricities, except we have a deficit over here towards all the way flipped over and going backwards in the plane, what we call retrograde. So the short period comets generally have prograde orbits, not so many retrograde orbits. But the long period comets come from every different inclination on the sky. They also come from every direction on the sky. So we got this one, at one, one orbit, one, one angle, but we also have this angle or orbiting around, okay? And that's what we call the longitude of the ascending node, which is a big fancy thing just to say, think of the other, a, other angle, all right? And you can see that's relatively flat across the full 360 degrees. So we've got these comets. Most of them have really long periods. They have really stretched out orbits. They come from all inclinations. They call them from all angles. What model do you have to, uh, have to get from that data? You get a cloud of, uh, of comets and a cloud that extends really, really far out. Now, caution, this diagram has a logarithmic scale. All right, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. All right, it's a little hard to, 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 to interpret because the planets are all in here out to 30, a, uh, 30 AU, but the Oort cloud extends out to 50,000 AU, over a thousand times farther from the sun than the Kuiper belt. So our short period comets go out to about 50 AU. The long period comets go out to about 50,000 AU. And that's the cloud, the distribution of, of comets that you get from those series of plots of the data. So you may have heard about Voyager. Voyager um, was recently reported to have left the solar system. And if you heard that, they were lying to you. It has not left the solar system, but it has entered interplanetary space. Let me review that. Here, uh, the Voyagers were launched in, in 1977. They both went past Jupiter and Saturn, and then Voyager 2 went past Uranus and Neptune, and then they kept on going throughout the solar system. And they have continued to fly out, out, out of the solar system. And what was announced was actually that Voyager 1 has just passed outside the boundary of the solar wind. 
So that pressure from the solar wind blowing out across interplanetary space, at some point that pressure from the wind is going to meet the interstellar medium, the material in between the stars, and the pressure is going to equalize. As the pressure goes down from the, the, from the solar wind and the, it meets the pressure from the interstellar medium, and at some point you're going to cross a boundary which we call the heliopause, which is the edge of the solar wind, and you'll get into interstellar space. It has been shown definitively that in August 2012, Voyager 1 passed across the heliopause and has now entered interstellar space. But that does not, as much of the media has uh, incorrectly interpreted, mean that it has left the solar system. Because you can see that Voyager 1 is only about 125 astronomical units away from the sun. Whereas the Oort cloud, which is still gravitationally bound to the sun, if you take the gravitational definition of the edge of the solar system, it extends out to 50,000 astronomical units. So Voyager 1 will actually have to travel for another 40,000 years before it leaves the gravitational edge of the solar system, although it has left the pressure edge, uh, the, pr the end of the, uh, 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 now outside of the solar wind and in interstellar space. Uh, and what this diagram, again, it's logarithmic on its axis, shows nicely is that the Oort cloud actually extends about a quarter of the way uh, to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. It extends almost a light year out into space in the Oort cloud, and the nearest star is about four, uh, four and a quarter light years away. So, these great comets really do have humble origins. You see these fantastic appearances on the sky, but yet they come from the edges, the outskirts, the rural, the nowheresville of the solar system. The short period comets coming from the Kuiper belt out beyond Neptune, and the long period comets coming from the Oort cloud extending well out into interstellar space.